Hey, hey, friends. I hope everybody is doing well. You know, before we get started today, I have a couple of jokes that I want to tell you because the last time I shared some jokes with you, it was so much fun. I know I had a good time. I hope you did too. And in honor of Father's Day, which was last week, um, but I didn't have time to tell jokes and I, I had other things that I needed to do. So here are a couple dad jokes. What do you call a pig who does karate? A pork chop. That's a good one, right? And you know, last night I dreamt that I was a muffler and I woke up exhausted this morning. That's another good one. So dads, put that in your repertoire because you can never have too many jokes, right? Right. All right. Uh, let's talk about last week, our first in-person service. It was wonderful being in the sanctuary together. People behave themselves, they socially distance, um, they did all the things that we needed for you to do. And for those of you that were at home, we missed you, but we totally understand um, that you need a little bit more time to feel comfortable. Um, after the service and this week, the pastoral staff, we met and we have decided we're going to take things nice and slow. What we have to tell ourselves that really, truly, time is our friend. And we can take as much time as we need to to, be, to review everything and look at it. And so um, today's service obviously is online. And then next weekend, um, Sunday, July 5th, we will also exclusively be online. Then the following Sunday, July 12th, we will be back here in the sanctuary again. Once we have that service, we will again reassess, look at all the options, all the things that um, help us make the best informed decision for our church here at Christian Life Fellowship. And again, let me speak to those people who are choosing to stay at home and watch online. That's a great decision. You know, all of us have different factors that we need to put into the equation to determine where we feel comfortable um, and when we can do that. And so, again, you are still part of the family and we applaud you. Small groups. Small groups are still meeting. Some of the small groups have just begun a new series. And so this, if you're not in a small group, this would be a great time to plug in. If that's something you'd like to do, please be sure to speak to Sp Pastor Scott and he will hook you up with that. The next thing I want to bring to your attention is our series called Preach It Pastor. We had such a marvelous time last week or last year with that. And so we wanted to give you the opportunity again. If you 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 know sometimes you're sitting in church and you think, "Man, I wish they would speak about so and so." And so here's your opportunity to submit some questions to us. What you need to do is go to our website, go clf Dot church hit the events page a thing will pop up with preach it pastor and if you click on that you'll be able to submit a question again I think there's four Sundays in July so we have to have at least four questions we've re received a couple so far and we would just encourage you to do that as well Thank you again for your faithfulness and giving uh, throughout this entire time. You have been faithful in giving to the church in your ties and your offerings and reaching out to other people in need. And we are so appreciative of that. Thank you. And if you would continue to do that, there are several ways. You can snail mail it. You can drop it off here at the church or you can uh, uh, obviously give online. Um, 4th of July. We have a really great time celebrating, please. Celebrating our country and what it means to be an American and to live in this great nation. Now today, Pastor Scott is going to continue our series, Jesus and the Great Outdoors. They have been fabulous. Um, we've taken a boat ride. We've sat on a well. And today, the lesson, the story, the preaching 
has to do with food. Imagine Pastor Scott being the one delivering that. I do know this. There is nothing about bacon in today's sermon. So sit back and enjoy, and may you experience the presence of God in your home. Well, good morning, CLF Church. It is so good to be with you and have you joining in for our service this morning. And we are continuing in our Jesus and the Great Outdoors series, just like Pastor Sherry said. Now, she made a statement that you all just heard with your own ears that there's a good chance, there's a probability that I will not be talking about bacon this morning. I just want to say that she is like, kind of like your typical weather person, she can make predictions, but there is just no absolutes. You know, anytime that I preach, it's sunny with a chance of bacon. And so, you know what? If you're sick of hearing about bacon, I'm sorry. Um, maybe this is the only time I'm going to talk about it, but it may come up. It may come up in my sermon. You never know, okay? So it's kind of like, where's Waldo? You guys can just sit on the edge of your seats, anticipating and waiting to see if I slip bacon somewhere into the message today. Okay, we'll see what happens. If I don't, then oh well. But I want to talk today about Jesus in the great outdoors, and the message is called Short Order Chef. <laughs> and that'll make sense as we go along today. So Jesus is traveling around. He's in the outdoors doing miracles teaching profound things that no one has ever heard before, coming from the heart of the Father. And so Jesus has this ministry that is just stirring all kinds of interest in the people from regions all around. And many would leave and they would travel a day's travel, hours and hours away from their home and their comfort and their resources and their marketplace and, and their normal life to go and find Jesus and people would leave their comfort and resources to come find the resource they desperately needed that is only found in Jesus. It was worth the journey for them. And being, being that Jesus was a prophet, being that Jesus was uh, healing, being, being that Jesus was performing miracles, being that Jesus was showing great kindness and love to people, uh, many began to wonder, is like, who is this guy? Could this be the one? Could this be the Messiah? Is this Elijah? You know, all throughout the Old Testament, uh, there's statements that Elijah was going to come and prepare the way for the Messiah to come. He's going to be the forerunner. And so, I actually want to take a second, and I want to take a step back from the ministry of Jesus today for just a, a little bit of this message. And I want to talk about the early prophets um, that we read about in the book of First and Second Kings, Elijah and Elisha. Elijah is the most profound, uh, the prophet that probably had the most reputation, and um, he was kind of the most famous of all the prophets, next to maybe Moses. You know, and the stuff that God did through this guy, Elijah, was just absolutely incredible. And Elijah, he gets to the end of his ministry, the end of his life here on earth, and he realizes that he needs to find somebody to kind of fill his shoes and take his place. And so he goes and he finds Elisha to come and be his servant, to walk with him and to learn from him to be his disciple. Um, why he couldn't find somebody that had a different name that wasn't so similar. It would be way easier to talk about them, you know, if it wasn't Elijah and Elisha, you know, if they could have had very different names, but it's just the way it is. So try to stay with me and, and be able to keep them, you know, separated. But Elijah um, had an amazing anointing. And an anointing is where God has chosen, he set someone apart, and then he's empowered them 
for a certain task. He's empowered them to do something. Like Jesus says, I'm anointed, you know, to preach the good news, to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim freedom for the captives. And, you know, and, and you have an anointing on your life to do whatever God's called you to do. And so Elijah is an anointed prophet. And as he's leaving in Second Kings chapter 2, his disciple Elisha gets kind of like one wish. You know, ask me for anything. What would it be? And he says, I want a double portion of your anointing. And so as Elijah is actually not dying and going into the ground, but he's being taken away in the air, just like Jesus left, his mantle falls upon Elisha and Elisha receives a double anointing, a double empowerment to continue in the ministry that God started in Elijah's life. You following me so far? And so um, Elisha leaves from chapter 2 of 2 Kings. Chapter 3 is really interesting. I encourage you to read it. It's a fun chapter. But then chapter 4 of 2 Kings, I've just got to tell you, it may be the most exciting, the most adventurous, the most crazy chapter in all of the Bible. Like when I read it, I literally feel like I am watching a Michael Jordan slam dunking in the air, hanging it out, highlight reel. But it's for Elisha, right? It's like the stuff that God does through Elisha, it is just mind-blowing. Let me give you a little bit of a rundown just of this one chapter, if I could just give you some highlights. The first thing that happens to a, with Elisha in chapter 4 of 2 Kings is there's a widow who comes up who's completely broke. She has hardly, hardly anything to her name, and she comes for uh, some help, and Elisha says, well, what do you have? And she says, well, I have a little bit of oil. And he says, okay, well, bring me the oil, and then go get as many vessels, pots, containers as you possibly can. Bring them all together, and watch what God's going to do. And so he begins to pour out of this little jar some of the oil, and the oil just continues to run, and it begins to fill up vessel after vessel after vessel. And the oil kept going until the vessels were all full. And so this widow goes from having nothing to actually having an abundance of wealth because the oil was very valuable. And so she pays off all her debt and she's got enough to live on. A pretty amazing story. Well, the very next thing that happens that we read about in chapter 4, Elisha, he goes and just does something that would probably put him in a straight jacket today. He goes into the room of this dead boy. He lays down on his body, hand to hand, you know, face to face, mouth to mouth, and begins to breathe into the lungs of this dead boy over and over. Nothing's happening. And then all of a sudden, the boy's eyes blink and he comes to life. All right? Wow, that's a double anointing kind of empowerment by God. He, he raises this dead boy to life. And then the next thing that happens is these guys are, so it's the middle of a famine, right? This is a, a season of famine in the land. And these guys are looking for food and they find a bunch of wild gourds and they make some stew out of it. Well, guess what? The gourds were poisonous. And so everybody's starting to feel ill and they're like, whoa, 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 what was in that stew? You know, this is, you're trying to kill us. And so Elisha comes. He says, give me a little bit of flour. He takes some flour and he sprinkles it over the pot. And he goes, okay, it's edible now. It's good to go. It won't hurt you. You know, and then these guys eat it and they're totally fine. And so Elisha, like literally with a little bit of flour, takes the poison out of this pot. Some of us who are not very talented cooks probably just need to keep some flour on hand so when we go ahead and lay the plate down in front of someone, we can sprinkle some flour and say, okay, now it's edible. You're good. It's not going to hurt you, you know, by faith. <laughs> well, the next thing that happens is someone delivers 20 loaves of bread, 20 chunks of bread to Elisha, and then there's a hundred hungry, big eaten men who come, and Elisha says, okay, we'll feed all these hundred men with these 20 loaves of bread. That may not seem like a big deal because we're used to like Wonder Bread that's got tons and tons and tons of, of slices in it, but these would have been small cakes of bread. And in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 43 and 44, this is where we pick it up. It says, what? His servants exclaimed, feed a hundred people with only this? But Elisha repeated, give it to the people so they can eat, for this is what the Lord says. 
everyone will eat and there will even be some leftover. And when they gave it to the people, there was plenty for all and some leftover just as the Lord had promised. You go a couple chapters later and Elisha makes an axe head that's sunk in the water, float by throwing a stick in the water. This dude, you know what I mean, just did some crazy things, empowered by God and led by the Holy Spirit, led by the Lord's leading in his life. And I just, you know, read that and I just stop and think, man, what would have it been like to be walking around to be a part of the crew, part of the, uh, the crowd of people or part of the inner circle that Elisha had to live day in and day out just wondering like, what's today going to hold? What's the adventure going to be? What kind of crazy miracle out of, the, out of the box, off the wall, crazy thing is going to happen today, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of the feeling you get as you read through this is like, Elisha doesn't do anything normal. <laughs> you know, everything he does is to show God's power, to show God's strength. And maybe you know somebody in your life where it's like every time you hang out with them, you are just bracing yourself for an adventure, right? It's like, it's like you hang out with some people and it's like everything weird just happens when you're with that person, you know, or, or whatever. Well, Kristen and I, when we first got married, we took a year off. Um, from any formal ministry, and we just focused in on the Lord and focused in on one another just to build our relationship and our marriage strong. And the first year that we were married, we committed that to the Lord. And we were just listening, okay, God, what's the next steps? And so the Lord actually led us on the same weekend. I got away um, just to get with the Lord and spend some time, and Kristen was home. And God spoke to both of us that we were supposed to contact um, a really good friend of ours, their parents who were our, um, Argentine missionaries. And I had never actually met them before, but the Lord put it on my heart. I'm supposed to get a hold of them and we're supposed to go work with them for a little bit. The Lord said the same thing to Kristen. I called my friend and my friend said, this is crazy. My parents, who don't really know you either, except the, the little bit I've told them about you, they were praying this morning and they said that the Lord put the loves on their heart that you guys were supposed to go down and work with them. So he gave me their number and we made a phone call and we booked tickets, you know, and we spent 40 days down in Argentina and this couple became like spiritual parents to us. And they were those type of people that it's like, you never know what kind of adventure you're going to be having when you hang out with them that day. And we did all kinds of, of ministry and we saw all, all kinds of mir miracles. We did one particular trip that was a week long where we went into a very desolate land and God did something that marked Kristen and I. We saw a miracle that kind of stood out from all the other miracles that we saw God do. So just about 14 years ago, Kristen and I head down to Buenos Aires to work with this amazing couple, this amazing family named the Babcocks, and they became very, very good friends of ours. And we're down there helping out with the different ministries that they uh, run and that they partner with. And one particular week out of the, the number of weeks that we were there with them, we decided to load up uh, the little Nissan Xterra uh, truck that they had, and we loaded it with supplies, and we headed out into what they call the impenetrable, which just basically means the impenetrable. And we're talking to all the locals in Buenos Aires about you know, where we're going, and they're like, nobody goes there. That place is crazy. It's scary. You know, It's a desolate land. It's the desert. Why would you ever want to go there? And we said, well, we're going there to reach the native people that are there that don't know Jesus. And we had a homemade um, screen that we could set up for the outside um, showing of the Jesus movie. And so we had a projector and a generator and a little sound system. And we just went to all these little villages up in the Impenetrable. And so we partnered with a local pastor that took us up that kind of knew the area. And he hired this guy to drive a truck in a trailer. And the guy was an ex-Golden um, like Glove 
prize fighter and got in trouble with the mafia and they cut his fingers off. And so he's driving down these dirt roads, swerving in and out and everything. And we're in the back of this truck and he's sitting there driving with, you know, his palm and some nubs, you know, of fingers. And we're thinking, what did we get into? And this guy's not a believer at all, you know? And so he was in for quite a ride on this trip. And so what we did was we'd go into these little towns and the people there have nothing. I mean, literally nothing. They've never heard of aspirin. They don't know what a toothbrush is. There's kids walking around and they have mange, you know, like, like an animal. I mean, they, they don't have soap. They haven't bathed. I mean, it was just a crazy, crazy experience. These poor people and the conditions that they lived in and they needed Jesus so badly. And most of them were just like starving to death. I mean, they very rarely would eat. And so what we did was we would set up a fire just like this in the middle of the community. Every night we'd go to a different village and we had enough food that we rationed it out that every village we could make one pot of stew so that we could feed these people. And as they began to smell the smoke in the center of the town and they began to smell the food cooking, they began coming from all corners of these towns and these villages to come and get some food. And then after we fed them, they would sit down and they would watch the Jesus movie. And then we would present the gospel to them and give them an opportunity to give their lives to Jesus. And it was absolutely incredible. Well, the first night, the first village, we're cooking this pot of stew and we're serving the stew and we're dishing it out to everybody. And everybody kind of gets enough. And then people start coming back for seconds and the, the pot of stew was empty. And we felt horrible that these people were starving. We didn't have more to give them than one plate of food. And so there's probably about two, 300 people that first night. Well, we get to the second town and we have the exact same pot of stew, the exact same amount. And we see people coming in, 300, 400. I mean, there was like twice as many people the second night as the first night. And we just started praying, God, we need more food. How are we going to feed these people? Please let this be enough. And so here's what we did. We had this driver, this unsaved driver, dishing out the food. And here he is, scooping, ladling the food and putting it on people's plates. And everybody goes through the line and they get a full plate of food. And then people start coming through for seconds. And he's still dishing out the food. And people are coming for thirds. And everybody's full. And this guy is sitting there and he's he's an unbeliever. And he's saying, what is going on? The pot is not going down. He's like, every scoop, I keep giving out the food. And there's still food in the pot. And we went the whole night serving food to people. And we left half a pot of food with the people when we left. Because God continued to multiply the food. He literally was multiplying the food. And so this unsaved truck driver ex-boxer in trouble with the mafia surrenders his heart to Jesus and says, I want this God that multiplies food. I want this God that shows the kind of love that I've seen in your guys' life. And so here's the thing, you know, we got to experience the greatest miracle of seeing God do something absolutely phenomenal in the natural by multiplying food, but it touched so many hearts and lives. So many people gave their life to the Lord because of seeing that miracle and then all the other miracles that Jesus did on that trip. And so we just said, God, here's what we have to work with. We have the same pot of food for every village. And we pray, God, that nobody will go hungry. We pray that there will be more than enough in every village that we go in. And God answered that. God so answered our prayer and our desire to bless these people. And I believe God wants to do the exact same thing in our lives with what we have in our hands. So like hanging out with our friends, the Babcocks, like hanging out with the prophet Elisha, hanging out with Jesus and following him would have been an incredible adventure. Can you imagine? I mean, seeing him perform miracles and heal people and, and do all kinds of crazy things would have just become the norm. Following Jesus would have been such an adventure, wouldn't it? I want to, I want to just kind of make a statement here, though, that two thousand years removed from when Jesus walked upon the earth, we are still called followers of Christ, and living our life led 
by and dependent on him should still feel like an exciting adventure where anything can happen at any time. Because that is the reality. Being a Christian and being a follower of Jesus is not like this boring life. It's not like this religious duty. You know, it's actually a life where we come into the living God and we come into an adventure where we never know what God's going to do and how he's going to do it, what he's going to ask us to do, and how he's going to meet us in our step of faith. It's an exciting life. It's a life of adventure, and it's a life lived by faith and lived by the dependency on Jesus Christ who can make all things happen because anything's possible with him. Amen? And so Elisha fed 100 guys with 20 loaves. And so Jesus, he goes out on a limb and he's like, I'm going to top that. I'm going to put a big display on. And we all know the story of Jesus multiplying the food for the multitude, for the masses. What you may not know or may not have realized is that Jesus actually does this twice. The first time it's recorded in all four of the Gospels. And it's the only miracle that's in all four of the Gospels except for the resurrection of Jesus. It's the only miracle that's recorded in all. And that, that lets me know it's a very important miracle. But he feeds 5,000 men plus all of their families. So the women and the children. Which means he probably fed fifteen to 20,000 people with just a little bit of bread and a couple fish. Right? We know that story. And so these miracles that he did, the first one was 5,000 and the second one was 4,000. And I want to just take a minute and I want to read both of these accounts because although they're very similar and some, some scholars actually believe that Matthew and Mark who record the second feeding of the multitude are actually referring to the, to the same feeding to, in two different places in the Bible, but that's not the reality. The reality is there are some significant differences about these two times that Jesus becomes a short order chef and he feeds thousands of people in a moment, in a minute. And so the first one is in Matthew 14, starting in verse 14. It says, Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. Jesus is awesome like that. He always has compassion, doesn't he? His heart is moved with compassion and he touches people in the place of their need. That evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, that isn't necessary. You feed them. Disciples, you feed them. And so their reply, but we only have five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. We'll bring them here, he said, and he told the people to sit down on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish, looked up toward heaven, and he blessed them. And then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterward the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers, about 5,000 men were fed that day in addition to all the women and children. Okay, so there's the first time Jesus feeds the multitude and he takes five loaves of bread and two fish and he feeds 5,000 men and their families. So what Jesus did there is kind of a mind-blowing thing for the disciples. And he actually had the disciples participate and be used to be the provision, the avenue for him to do a miracle in these people's lives. Now remember, I said at the beginning of all this that people would travel for miles and miles and miles and they would be out for days sometimes to come and hear Jesus. And so it was a big deal. Some of them were very hungry at this point. And for Jesus to feed them, not just a little bit to tide them over, but more than enough where there's leftovers littering the ground, that's a big deal. That's an incredible amount of food that came out of five loaves and two fish. Matthew 15, so one chapter later, it kind of happens again. It says, Then Jesus called his disciples and, to and told them, 
I feel sorry for these people. They've been here with me for three days and they have nothing left to eat. I don't want to send them away hungry or they will faint along the way. And the disciples replied, Well, where would we get enough food here in the wilderness for such a huge crowd? Well, one chapter ago, um, hmm, we fed 5,000. We got about 4,000 here, huh? That's a good question, disciples. So Jesus, Jesus asked them, how much bread do you have? And they replied, seven loaves and a few fa- small fish. And Jesus told all the people to sit down on the ground. And then he took the loaves and the fish and he thanked God for them and he broke them into pieces. He gave them to the disciples who distributed the food to the crowd. And they all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up seven large baskets of leftover food. And there were 4,000 men who were fed that day in addition to all the women and the children. And so... You may not see a lot of difference here, but let me give you a little background. Here's the biggest difference. Here's what makes these two different accounts very important that that both of them should be in the Bible, but very distinctly different from one another. And the difference that I want all of us to pay attention to today with these two stories is location. Location, location, location. Because In the first account, Jesus is ministering to a certain group of people. And in the second account, he's ministering to a very different group of people. The feeding of the 5,000, the first miracle, it took place, place near Bethsaida, close to the Sea of Galilee. And in the contrast, the feeding of the 4,000 took place in the region of the Gerasenes, in the region around Decapolis. Decapolis was uh, this kind of metropolitan area. It was a, a very booming, wealthy area full of unbelievers, idol worshipers, people that uh, were part of the Roman government and people that, you know, really knew nothing and wanted nothing to do with God. They had many gods. They were into philosophy. They were you know, very much about new agey type things and gods and, you know, things like that, worshiping anything and everything. And so when Jesus does the first miracle, he's surrounded by mostly Jewish people. The crowd in Bethsaida would have been mostly Jews. And they would have been people that were there to connect with Jesus, kind of wondering, is this really the Messiah? Is he the one? Now, when he's in um, the Capolis, he's ministering to a people who probably know very little, if anything, about the Jewish culture, about the Hebrew culture. And so you have two completely different groups. And I, I believe that Jesus wants to bless and he wants to provide for his people, right? But he also wants to provide and he wants to bless those who are not yet his people. God wants to do the miraculous in his house, among his believers, his body, his family, the fellowship that you were a part of, right? The church, but also in outside in the world and in everyday situations among unbelievers. And so I believe it's really important that we recognize that these are two different accounts where Jesus feeds the multitude because in one he's saying, I can do a a multiplication, amazing miracle of provision for my people, but I can also do an amazing uh, multiplication provision for unbelievers, for those who are lost and those who haven't yet found me. You know, we often have it in our mind that when we come to church, God can do a miracle. When we're talking amongst believers, there's faith for God to do something incredible. But I believe that God's heart is for us to expect the miraculous, not just when we're together with believers, but when we're in the world with unbelievers. See, he wants to do both. He, there, there's this contrast between the two miracles, and there's a, a contrast between, you know, we want to expect God to take care of his people, 
but we want to see God do miracles to draw hearts and lives into him. It might just be that as we look at what we have in our hand to use, and as we take a step of faith to reach out to an unbeliever, we'll see Jesus do the most incredible miracles. You know, we can grow comfortable with having an expectation for God to move in miraculous ways in a gathering of believers and then living out of our own abilities and our own resources in everyday life in the world. We say, you know what, I can have faith when I'm at an altar and I got people praying with me. But then somehow that faith gets disconnected when we get out into the real world and we're going through our daily business and we come up against, you know, some kind of obstacle or some kind of situation and we resort to every one of our resources and abilities and our talents and, and our wisdom and, and what can we do in our strength when God is like, you know what, that's when I want my strength to be put on display is when you're out in your everyday life. I want to be a part of doing the miraculous in your everyday. Not just when you're in a church service. Not just when you're gathering together for a prayer service. Not just when you're calling up a Christian friend. You know, I saw God do miracles in a freezer, in a factory in people's lives because I stepped out and I had faith that God wanted to heal, wanted to, to bless somebody who didn't know them at all. And I believe that we all have people in our lives that God has set up and he's positioned for us to say God's the God of multiplication. He can multiply food. He can multiply whatever you need. He can be the answer to the questions that you're asking, right? See, remember that the signs and wonders that God does are not to point to you and me. They're to point to him. It's the signs the miraculous wonders that he does that are supposed to point people's eyes to him who's the author and the provider and the finisher of our faith and our needs. And he's the, he's the author of the miraculous. He's our source. He's our strength. And I think God likes doing miracles because when people that don't believe in anything or they believe in some other faith or God, when they see Jesus do something that's impossible— through our life or in our life, they say, well, it could not possibly be that person, so it must be their God. And I believe that's what Jesus was doing when he was feeding the 4,000 in an area where people were not really aware of who he was. You know, it's uh, the kindness of God that draws people to repent repentance, it says in Romans 2. And so, you know, Jesus isn't waiting for people to be found before he meets their need and takes care of them. This might mess with our theology a little bit because we think, well, God wants to bless his family, his believers, his, his you know, followers. But it's Jesus goes out to reach those who are lost, to reach those that are sick, to reach those that haven't heard. And he does miraculous things to show people who don't know him, who he is, and how much he loves him, them, and to bring them into the family. It's his kindness that draws people in. And so, you know, when we bring a prayer request for an unbeliever or somebody that we would say is not living a good life, we don't need to come to God and make apology about who they are. God already knows their story. He knows their brokenness. He knows their deep needs more than you or I ever could. And we just say, God, I pray, Jesus, that you would touch this person the way only you can and draw their heart to you. Jesus came to save, to heal, to deliver those that are lost. You know, the fact that these two significant miracles are both recorded make a bold statement that Jesus came for all who will call upon his name and he wants to be the bread of life for anyone who will receive him. You know, here, here's a humorous thing that happens. After, after Jesus does this multiplication of food twice, then we pick it up in Mark chapter 8, verse 14 through 21. It says, The disciples had forgotten to bring any food. 
they had only one loaf of bread with them in the boat. So they're traveling on a boat again. And as they were crossing the lake, Jesus warns them, Watch out, beware the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. And at this, they began to argue with each other because they hadn't brought any bread. And Jesus knew what they were saying. So he said, why are you arguing about having no bread? Don't you know or understand even yet? Are your hearts too hard to take it in? You have eyes, but you can't see. You have ears, but you can't hear. Don't you remember anything at all? When I fed the 5,000 with five loaves of bread, how many baskets of leftovers did you pick up afterward? Well, 12, they said. And when I fed the 4,000 with seven loaves, how many large baskets of leftovers did you pick up? Uh, seven, they said. And he goes, don't you understand yet? Don't you understand yet? I mean, this seems ridiculous. He references both of these miracles. He's like, he's like, you've seen me multiply bread. By now you should be like, you know, we don't even need to bring bread. You know, we, he can just multiply. He can make bread come out of nowhere, right? Bread should not be a hang-up for you. <laughs> you've seen I have power over bread, right? But here's the thing. We are pretty much the same way, aren't we? How often have you seen God come through and do something absolutely incredible in your life or in the life of somebody else. And then you come up against another opportunity to believe in faith, and it seems like a brand new obstacle, even though it's probably real similar to the last time that God showed up and he did some incredible thing. But we, again, we revert back to, oh no, what do we have in our strength? What do we have in our ability? You know, how is this going to affect us? And, and we start going down the list of all the oh no's, you know, of a situation instead of looking at the oh, look at God, look at Jesus and what he can do and what he's done. We have the miracle worker who specializes in taking the little we have and making it more than enough, whatever the situation might be. And the question that God always asks us, you and I, that we have to make an answer for is what is in your hand? Because every situation and every trial and every problem and every impossibility that we come up to in this life, if God's going to step in and do something, it means we don't have enough. We don't have the answers. We can say what we have is five fish and two, or five loaves of bread and two fish or, you know, or whatever. Or we have this much money and it needs to be this much. Or we have, you know, this much time to, to do this. Or, you know, we have this resource. We have, here's what I have, God. And then God says, will you take a step of faith with what you have so I can multiply it? Elisha answered this question over and over and over. When he was faced with an impossible situation, God said, well, Elisha, what do you have in your hand? And he would use whatever it was he had at his disposal. And God's power and his anointing and his miraculous working strength would step in and make it more than enough, would multiply it, and would cause everyone around to be like, whoa, didn't see that coming. And you know that God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus wants to take what we have in our hands. He wants to take what we have to work with, and he wants to make something miraculous happen through it. His power, God's power, flows and works in unity with our willingness to step out in faith. See, God's miraculous power isn't magic. People that practice magic, they just want to cast a spell and wave a wand and just boom, make things happen. That's not how God works. God works in relationship and he works in partnership with you and I. It's not magic. It's faith and it's dependency and it's trust in the one who says nothing is impossible to those who will believe. We can feed 15, 20,000 people with a boy's lunch if you'll just believe. And then he says, now you go and you start feeding these people. 
And just like I'm watching this pot get poured out so that people can watch the Jesus video in Argentina, I'm realizing that, you know what? We just were faithful. We just took what we had, let God use it, and he did the miracle. It's not up to us to do the miracle. It's up to us to respond in obedience with what we have in our hands. Amen? See, Jesus wants us to see needs and believe that he can use whatever little we have to be the seed, whatever we have to be the seed for his multiplying power to create a bountiful harvest. You know, I recall as a young believer looking at people that I would say were mighty men and women of faith and, and putting them on a pedestal and saying, what is it about them? They are so amazing. I want to be like them someday. And standing where I'm standing today, after walking with the Lord many years, I realize that there's nothing special about any person. It's Jesus. Anybody has the potential, if they'll believe in Jesus, to see him come and work through our lives. He's just looking for people who are willing and people who are obedient. You know, there, there's nothing important or nothing special about a person except for Jesus. And the way that we see God use us more powerfully is by building a deeper relationship with Jesus, by reading his word and by worshiping him and by getting to know his heart so that when he speaks, remember he says to the disciples when they're like, oh no, is it the bread? Did we not bring enough bread? Is that what you're talking about, Jesus? He's like, you're deaf and you can't see. Wake up. It's not about that. Have you not already seen me do all these miracles? It's, it's about beginning to believe in me and that when I am with you and that when you're following me, when I'm leading you, that nothing's impossible, that you don't need to freak out, that you don't need to look around the world that is falling apart today and try to have all the answers for it. You just need to know what I've put in your hand and how to be faithful and trustworthy with what I've given you and then how to take the next step that I want to lead you in so I can multiply it and do miraculous things through your life. Here's, here's a really interesting, we're, we're nearing the end here, but here's an interesting statement that Jesus makes and it's talking about the prophets that went before John and how John the Baptist, how he was the greatest of all these prophets. In Matthew 11, 11, it says this, I tell you the truth, Jesus is talking, all of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. Yet even the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. And from the time that John the Baptist began preaching until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and violent people are attacking it. For before John came, all the prophets in the law of Moses looked forward to this present time. And if you are willing to accept what I say, he is Elijah, the one, of the, um, the, one the prophet said would come. Anyone who has ears to hear should listen and understand. And so Jesus is saying, look, the time that he's delivering is a time where the kingdom is being established. His kingdom is being established on the earth. And he's saying everybody that's going to be a part of the kingdom of God Everybody who's going to be a part of this season that we live in right now, the church age, this age of the earth where Jesus is living and working by his Holy Spirit through people called his church. He says anybody that's a part of his church is greater than all of the prophets, than any of the prophets of the Old Testament. Because what we have is the Holy Spirit. What we have is God himself connected with us because of what Jesus did on the cross. Because he tore the veil so that the Holy Spirit could leave the temple, could leave the Ark of the Covenant, that his presence could now come and dwell in us, that he could fill our lives, that we could be vessels to carry him around the earth. And he's saying those who are a part of this kingdom that I'm establishing, they are going to live in a way that is completely different than all the rest of the prophets and it's what the prophets of old were looking forward to was the day when Messiah, when Jesus would establish his kingdom. And so I want you to know right now that you have 
the power of Jesus in you because you have the Holy Spirit in you if you've made Jesus the Lord of your life. You have the ability to live in a season of famine and just take what God's put in your hand and see the oil never run out. To take what little bit you have and, and see it provide for a multitude of people. You have the ability to be able to open your mouth and the Holy Spirit will put the words in your mouth to speak that you can fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, that you can declare with boldness the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you know that that may be one of the hardest steps of faith that we take as believers? Is to actually step out over our comfort zone and to talk to somebody that maybe says they hate God or they don't know God or they don't want anything to do with God or maybe they've even made fun of you because of your relationship with God. But to be able to step over that threshold and be bold and to allow the Holy Spirit to minister to them through your mouth. And let me just tell you, when you take that, that nerve-wracking first step, it's amazing how the Holy Spirit takes over. It's amazing. It's an adventure. It is, like, it, it is like an adrenaline rush when you start seeing the Holy Spirit working through you. You know, and so I just want to encourage you today that you're a short order chef. <laughs> just like Jesus, you know what I mean? He can, he can take whatever impossible situation and turn it around. He's working in you. He can take whatever situation that you're dealing with or you're standing in in your life and he can flip it upside down and turn it around. He can cause a multiplication to happen. He can open doors of opportunity that you wouldn't even know how to pray for, but you just say, here God's what I have. I give it to you and I take a step of faith. Lead me and guide me and give me your peace. And that's an important factor is that, you know what, you pray, you bring things to the Lord, and then you wait for his peace. There's a, the, this peace that you just sense on the inside that the, God gives a green light and says, okay, do this, take a step, you know? And so that's having ears to hear and eyes to see, to being led by the Holy Spirit. We need to stop looking at every situation in our life and saying, okay, how can we do this with our ability? Do we have enough of our own provision? Is this possible? Has anybody else been able to do this? Right? Faith is, is, is coming up against a situation and saying, God, I don't have enough, but you do. How do you want to use what I have? How do you want to take this little bit and make it go as far as you need it to go? to accomplish your will and your purpose in my life. And so I want to pray for you today. First of all, if you don't know Jesus, this miracle worker, know that his love and his kindness is chasing after you. And he wants to draw you in. He wants to show himself real in your life. And I invite you to make him the Lord of your life this morning, to pray a simple prayer and just say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you for dying for me. Come into my heart. Fill me and make me new and help me to live for you. In Jesus' name, just pray that prayer and mean it. And then begin to walk with him. Begin to read the Bible. Begin to pray. Connect with some other believers that can help lead you and disciple you. And for the rest of us, whatever you're facing right now and whatever you're feeling, whatever kind of a famine you might have in your life, just know that nothing's impossible for God. And he has a way where there seems to be no way. He has the ability to cause the little bit that you have to work with to be more than enough. And so, Father, I just pray right now, God, over your people, your children, God, who right now maybe are are asking the question is like, okay, God, I've seen you do stuff before, but what about now? What can you do now? What can you do with what I have now here? And God, I pray that you 
would meet every single one of us right where we're at with what we have in our hands, that you would empower us, that you would lead us, and that, Lord God, you would show your miraculous working power in our lives. I pray you bless every single person hearing this message right now. Strengthen our faith. Encourage us, Lord God, to live the extreme adventurous life that you have for us, Lord, by trusting you in a radical way with every area of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have an amazing rest of the day, an amazing week.